Ever find yourself in a difficult business situation? Or do you have a difficult time relating to others when conversing? Never Split the Difference, written by Chris Voss, addresses one of the most difficult subjects that most of us learn but never master, the art of a good negotiation. Whether you realize it or not, everyone in this world uses negotiation on a regular basis, whether it is at work, the grocery store, or under their own roof. You may not even realize that there are other alternatives to the seemingly normal outcomes of conversations in your life. Voss walks the reader through various difficult and trying conversational situations, showing you what works and what doesn't. He also teaches you how to read subtle body language clues as you observe someone you are speaking with. Written in 2016, this book is up to date on the most current methods of interrogation used all the way from your local police precinct to the FBI. Chris Voss is a well-known businessman, as well as an author and professor. He worked for 24 years as a hostage negotiator and is responsible for freeing some of the most famous political prisoners of the late 90s. Voss retired from the FBI in 2007 and currently runs his own consulting company, The Black Swan Group. The New Rules Negotiation isn't just difficult, it's an art, and a difficult one to master when it's your family or friends' lives that are on the line. Voss faces some of the world's top negotiation professors trying to stay calm as they demand one million dollars or they will kill his son. He takes a deep breath and regains his composure. After all, he's been training his whole life for situations like this. He quickly disarms his counterparts with a series of questions that give them the illusion of control. But really, it is Voss who is calling all the shots. Be the smartest dumb guy in the room. During a Harvard negotiation class he attended in 2006, Voss discovered the best way to get your opponent to concede to your demands is to use questions to make it seem like they are being dishonest or unfair. This is known as a passive-aggressive approach. When he started his stint at Harvard, most of the professors used a cut-and-dry, fixed-outline approach to negotiation. Humans are naturally impulsive, irrational, and emotional beings, and thus every interaction is different and cannot be outlined on paper. Negotiation must be learned and changed as needed during a confrontation. Old School Negotiation Hostage-taking and the subsequent negotiations to attempt and free them have been known to humans for centuries. However, the course of action has evolved drastically over time. Up until the 1970s, force was the preferred method to rescue hostages. Usually, this meant sending in forces and trying to shoot the hostages free. This didn't always work, and often caused the loss of lives on both sides. This all changed in October 1971, when a hostage situation caused by an airline hijacking left an innocent man dead, because the FBI decided to start shooting instead of taking the hijacker down. Shortly after, the New York Police Department became the first police force to fully embrace a method of hostage and crisis negotiation. Heart versus Mind it wasn't until the 1980s that economist Amos Tversky and psychologist Daniel Kahneman discovered that feelings are actually a form of thinking. This discovery radically changed everything people thought they knew about negotiation. Tversky and Kahneman discovered over 150 cognitive biases that affect the way humans negotiate. Voss explains the most common ones and what they mean when conversing. The most common cognitive bias is the framing effect, which shows how differently people respond to the same choice depending on how it is presented or framed for them. Another common bias is prospect theory, which explains how humans will take risks because of their aversion to loss. This leads to loss aversion, a cognitive bias in which people are more likely to do something to avoid a loss than to achieve a gain. Kahneman developed this theory further explaining how the human mind operates on two systems, one that is largely emotional and another that is logical. The emotional part of the brain is much more influential and dominant when it comes to human interactions. The FBI gets emotional. After discovering the large part emotions play in a negotiation, the FBI quickly began to adapt and change its methods, and one of the first things the agency introduced was the BATNA, 
an acronym that stands for Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. Although the FATNA helped minimize losses in business negotiations and when problem-solving, the FBI quickly realized it didn't work with kidnappers who were emotionally compromised. This led to a new wave of students who began to be trained to not only know the facts about their adversary, but also to attempt to understand them and their deep-rooted emotional motives. Life is a negotiation. Some readers are probably wondering at this point how anything they've read so far will ever apply to their lives. Boss boils it down to a simple point. Life, as a whole, is a negotiation. Negotiation is nothing other than communication in which a certain result is desired. You negotiate every day, whether it is with your kids, at your job, or when buying a car. The first step to becoming a good negotiator is to get over your fear of confrontation. If you're too scared to ask for what you want, then you will never get it. How this book is set up This book builds upon itself, each chapter serving as the basis for the next one. It is not a psychology book, but rather a deep reflection of the art of negotiation and how to get to a point where you can use it to improve interactions that occur in your everyday life. Each chapter contains an anecdote of one of Voss's experiences in the negotiating world. He has personally used and experienced success with every single one of these methods. Be a Mirror September 30th, 1993 Two masked robbers entered a bank in New York City, injuring the single security guard on duty and taking the two female bank tellers hostage. Voss and a co-worker were called to the scene to negotiate the release of the three hostages. Assumption Blind Hypothesis Guide When Voss and his co-worker arrived on the scene, law enforcement already had an idea of what they assumed was going on inside the bank and figured the standoff would end within an hour. Voss quickly found this not to be the case. Good negotiators need to enter the scene, ready to deal with surprises, and prepared to have their assumptions proved wrong. The lead robber was feeding the police fake information, who, in turn, were basing all their assumptions on it. While listening to the lead robber ramble on, Voss concluded that everything they had assumed so far was wrong. Calm the Schizophrenic The operation center Voss and the local law enforcement were operating out of was across the street from the bank. Voss spent most of his time coaching Joe, the officer who had been interacting with the robbers on the phone. His co-worker, along with three local officers, were assigned to simply listen to the conversation and look for clues. As humans, we aren't always the best listeners. We are subject to distractions, listening with a bias, and only hearing what we want to hear. By having a few other people listening to the same conversation, the possibility of missing a vital clue drastically decreases. The first step to a successful negotiation is to find out what your opponents actually need or want and get them to talk about it. This is when you can begin to validate their emotions and gain their trust. Slow it down. The number one mistake people make when entering into a negotiation is that they go too fast. If you're too much in a hurry, people often don't feel as if you are actually listening to them and instead feel that you don't understand them. Voss and the local authorities were able to gain an upper hand in their negotiation when they slowed it down for the most unlikely reason. The hostage-takers were hungry and wanted food. Everyone was trying to come to an agreement on how to get the food into the bank in a manner the lead robber would accept. During this time, The local authorities canvassed the area and found several possible identities for their lead robber. This gave them the upper hand, as they now knew something about him that the lead robber wasn't aware of. The Voice Five hours into the negotiation, the police finally let Voss take over the phones. The first thing he did was to use what he refers to as a late-night FM DJ voice to establish his presence on the phone line. This voice is classified as a calming voice of reason and is useful in many situations. Using this tone of voice is like smiling at someone when you walk into a room. It calms the person and leads to a relaxed state. Be careful to avoid upward inflection when using this voice, as it can sound like a question, which invites uncertainty into the encounter. Mirroring 
The next important tool to use in a negotiation is mirroring. This is when you repeat back to someone exactly what was just said. This breeds familiarity and leads to an unconscious bond of trust as humans are naturally drawn to what is similar. It is FBI protocol to mirror by repeating the last three words spoken back to the speaker in a question. This is where the negotiation finally began to go the way Voss wanted it to. Using mirroring, he was able to get the robber they had not yet heard from on the phone. Voss convinced him to turn himself in. The lead robber quickly unraveled after his partner surrendered, and within a few hours, all three of the hostages were recovered unharmed. The lead robber, a man by the name of Chris Watts, was placed under arrest. How to Confront and Get Your Way Without Confrontation The problem with confrontation, in the aggressive sense, is that an angry or dominant approach only leads to more anger. Voss outlines the proper way to approach someone and to get your way without having to use any aggression. 1. Use a calming voice, such as the late-night DJ voice mentioned above. 2. Start with the words, I'm sorry. 3. Mirror. 4. Be silent. Give your opponent a chance to answer. Do not speak during this time. 5. Repeat the above steps as needed. These steps may feel a bit awkward and unnatural when you first begin to use them, but you will be pleasantly surprised by the results they will yield. Make sure you practice before attempting to implement this method. Don't feel their pain. Label it. In 1998, Voss found himself in another hostage negotiation situation. This time, he was in an apartment building trying to talk down three heavily armed fugitives who had been holed up for days. The fugitives were scared, and fear is one of the strongest emotions to influence our actions. Any good negotiator must know how to take an emotion like fear and label it. This leads people to being able to talk about it. Tactical Empathy Voss began to use empathy to speak to the fugitives on the other side of the door. He started every sentence with a general statement such as, It looks like, and it seems like. Voss continued this for hours and to his surprise, the fugitives surrendered six hours later. When asked why they had surrendered, the fugitives explained that they finally realized that Voss wasn't going to go away. His voice had calmed them, thus convincing them to surrender. This method is known as tactical empathy. As the name implies, you use empathy to relate and understand the feelings of others. This gives you an opportunity to listen to what is behind the feelings and helps you understand what motivates your opponent, even if he or she doesn't state them outright. Tactical empathy isn't just speaking. It's reading another person's body language, their face, gestures, and tone of voice. It's all the things that are left unsaid. The more you listen, the more active your own brain will be, and the more you will find that you truly understand the person you are talking to. Labeling one reason tactical empathy works is because you are labeling the emotions the other person may not even realize he or she is experiencing. When you give someone's emotion a name, it validates it and makes the person feel understood. This method is especially useful when you are dealing with a tense opponent. In order to label emotions, you must be able to spot them first. This can be done by watching for subtle cues when speaking with someone. Even the smallest changes can indicate a hidden emotion, and it is your job as a negotiator to find them and draw them out. Make sure that when you label the emotions you find, you use general and non-personal terms, i.e., it seems like. Neutralize the negative, reinforce the positive. Labeling an emotion is not enough on its own. How you label it is also extremely important. Human behavior is composed of two parts what you see, and what you don't. Generally, what you don't see is more important than what you do see. It is the underlying emotions that lead to the behavior you are observing. Anger is a damaging emotion, but that doesn't mean it should be avoided. As humans, we only begin to process emotion when we recognize it. So, labeling the anger of someone can go a long way to resolving the issue that made the person angry in the first place. Clear the road before advertising the destination. Fear is an obstacle in negotiations. The faster you can remove fear, 
the quicker you can address the real issues at hand. To remove fear, you must label it. This will cause the negative reactions in the brain's processing center to fade. This process can take a while, so don't be discouraged if you don't quell fears in the first five minutes of a negotiation. Do an accusation audit. An accusation audit is a powerful tool you can use to disarm your opponent. An accusation audit is when you mention the thoughts your opponents may have about you before they have a chance to do so themselves. The best way to begin these conversations is with general statements as mentioned above, making sure you avoid pointed pronouns such as you or I. Start with something like, it sounds like, or we understand. You will be surprised by how far this can get you towards achieving your desired results in an encounter. Beware, yes. Master, no. Most of us have experienced a call from a telemarketer at some point in our life. Have you ever felt tricked into saying yes to whatever they are selling? If so, you aren't the only one. Telemarketers are often pros at what they do, saying certain words in certain formats that will convince you to buy their product. Although telemarketers might be pros at getting you to say yes, this isn't what we strive for in a negotiation. It's more meaningful and beneficial in the long run for your opponent to say no. No starts the negotiation. Words are powerful, and certain words will elicit responses in your counterparts in ways that may surprise you. No is one of these words. It is commonly thought that the word no is an end word, but that is a misconception. Rather, no is an opener. It starts the negotiation. Humans have a deep desire for autonomy and maintaining control over their lives. If you use a demanding and self-righteous tone, you are taking away the feeling of control. By starting with a question that elicits a no from your opponents, you are letting them maintain their autonomy. This will leave them more open to listen to what you have to say. This has a positive effect on negotiation. Persuade in their world. You have probably had it drilled into your head that you need to get a yes for a business transaction to be successful. But this is not necessarily true. There are many types of yes, and not all of them are good and lead to success. One of these types of success is the counterfeit yes. This is when someone wants to say no, but then decides to say yes just so that you stop pestering him or her. This is dangerous because someone will often agree but then fail to follow through with whatever was agreed to. Next, you have the confirmation yes. This form of yes is mostly unimportant. It is usually used to answer a quick yes or no question. The confirmation yes is harmless in most situations, but it can also be used to lay a trap, so be cautious. The final type of yes, and the one you should strive for, is the commitment yes. A commitment yes is a true agreement, an indication that the person behind it will follow through with actions. It can be difficult to tell a commitment yes from a counterfeit yes. Learning to recognize the differences is an art in and of itself. Voss learned the hard way the difference between these forms of yes while volunteering for a suicide hotline. During a performance review, Voss was instructed to answer a call while his supervisor listened in. The call seemed to be going well. The person on the other end of the line agreed with everything Voss was saying. When Voss hung up the phone, however, his supervisor stated it was the worst call he had ever heard. Voss had been so busy trying to get the man to agree with him that he had overlooked the fact that the man was feeding him counterfeit and confirmation yeses, nothing that would make a lasting difference. Besides just aiming for the right sort of yes response, it is important to always enter a negotiation honestly. Don't put up a front, and don't try to fake being nice. People can always tell the difference, and this will lead to them feeling manipulated. When you strive for a response, you avoid these issues and can receive the proper commitment yes response. No is protection. When someone is allowed to say no to something, it comes with a feeling of safety and being protected. Even though you do eventually want to receive a yes response, by starting with a no, you are keeping your opponent from being skittish or defensive. This leaves the mental airwaves open to hearing what you are trying to say. Starting with a question that elicits a no response also allows the real issues to be brought forth. 
there is no need for fake pleasantries. Email Magic – How Never to Be Ignored Again Everyone has been there. You send an email and never receive a response. This leads to feelings of being ignored and worry if the email is business-related. The best way to handle this is to send an email that requires a no response. That way, the person you are trying to get a hold of will reach out and explain. Voss suggests using the following line. Have you given up on this project? Next time you are being ignored, try it and see if you receive a response. Trigger the two words that immediately transform any negotiation. In 2000, Voss was assigned to negotiate the release of political prisoners from a militant Islamic group in the Philippines. During this incident, he was assigned to work with the CNU, or Crisis Negotiation Unit. The CNU focuses all its efforts in negotiation on trying to make a connection meaningful enough to facilitate a positive change. You know you've made it to this moment when you hear the words, That's right. Create a subtle epiphany. The first crucial step in achieving your goal is to figure out how your adversaries came to be in their position. This can mean either a price amount in a negotiation or the reason they are approaching your business in the first place. To find this answer, you need to know where your opponent is coming from. Once you figure out how they arrived at their position, you can begin to strive for the that's right response. Trigger a that's right with a summary. Sometimes arriving at the epiphany mentioned above can take a lot of work. It's important to use all the active listening tools you've learned to assist you. Use effective pauses, minimal encouragers, mirroring, and labeling as you see fit. If those don't work, then pull out the summary. A good summary is a rehash of things your opponent has said tied to your opponent's underlying emotions as you identify them. When your opponents hear what they've been saying repeated back to them, they should feel understood leading for them to say the desired, that's right response. That's right is great, but when you're right, nothing changes. When you hear the words, that's right, you know you were successful. But if you hear the words, you're right, you're in deep trouble. The response, you're right, is an escape response. People use it when they give up and want the person bothering them to go away. Make sure you word your question carefully, keeping the pronoun I out of it. This will help lead you to the that's right response. When used properly, the that's right response can be used to make a sale or even further your career. It doesn't come without practice, though. Make sure you think of questions that could possibly lead to the desired response before you enter the situation in which you may need them. Bend their reality. In 2004, Boss found himself called to Haiti to deal with a sudden surge of capital-driven kidnappings. It was so bad during this time that an estimated 8 to 10 people were kidnapped each day. During this period of terror, many family members of victims came to Voss believing they had no hope other than to pay the demanded ransom. But this is never the case. Even in the direst negotiations, there's always leverage. There is no such thing as a formula when approaching a negotiation. Don't compromise. When people are faced with a business deal, they often revert to lessons learned in their childhood, getting a deal by compromising. A compromise can be as simple as meeting in the middle or adding extras to one side of the deal to make it seem more fair. This is a childish and naive solution, and a compromise is never an answer to a business deal. Great negotiators never settle, and they most certainly don't ever split the difference. To become a great negotiator, you have to face the hard stuff and let the idea of compromise go. Deadlines. Make time your ally. Time is one of the most important aspects of a negotiation. Sometimes deadlines aren't concrete, but when they are, they can cause people to make rash decisions. Even if you enter a negotiation with a hard deadline, resist the urge to make it known or to act on it. The best way to avoid the restraining line of thinking of a deadline is to tell yourself that all deadlines are self-inflicted and thus can be changed. While working on the Haitian kidnapping cases, Voss began to notice a pattern. The closer it came to the weekend, Friday, the more desperate the kidnappers were to get paid. Discovering this shifted the line of thinking and put Voss on top. Now that he knew the kidnappers had a deadline, he knew he could bide his time to get a better deal. 
This doesn't just apply to kidnappings. Car salesmen are more likely to make a deal towards the end of the month when they have a quota to hit. Businesses will agree to a better deal when a quarter ends. This is why many negotiators think it is best to keep deadlines a secret. However, it is important to remember that negotiations go both ways. Ultimately, each side is looking to gain something from the other. So if it's over for one side, it's over for both parties involved. So if you share your deadline, don't think of it as a finite end. No such thing as fair. As a society, we are convinced that life is supposed to be fair. But this is incorrect, as the concept of fair is based on emotions. It's impossible to keep emotions out of a decision, but we can't let them rule our business deals. When you approach a negotiation looking to make things fair, you are projecting your thinking on the other party. This is not the proper mindset when approaching a negotiation. The F word. Why it's so powerful, when to use it, and how. Humans are highly impacted by the meaning behind the word fair. In our minds, it reflects how much respect we've been given. If we feel we have not been given enough, we are more likely to lash out and less likely to make a deal. Human neural activity supports this fact, and certain parts of the brain light up during social interactions with a perceived level of unfairness. Fair is an emotionally driven and powerful word. It must be used carefully. Like yes, there are many uses of fair, and only one is beneficial. One of the most common and worst uses of the word is as a defense. This happens when someone suggests something and then insists that he or she is just trying to be fair. If this has ever happened to you, you know the feeling of discomfort that usually follows a statement like this. The second use of fair is far more sinister. In this context, the word is hurled as an accusation at the person sitting across the table. If this happens to you, the best response is simply to mirror them. This will lessen the attack and allow the speaker to give more information. The final use of fair is the one you should strive for. Both sides use it honestly and ask to let each other know if anything seems unfair. How to discover the emotional drivers behind what the other party values. In order to make a sale or strike a business deal, you must know what emotions drive your opponents. Once you know how they feel, you will be able to properly market your product to them. Remember to appeal to their emotional side when presenting your project. Bend their reality. Different amounts of money, just like different items, can have different values to different people. For example, photos of family members are usually only important to those who are part of the family in said photo. To a random man in the street, the same priceless photo is just kindling for a fire. This is because value is based on perception. So, if you change someone's perception, you're more likely to get him or her to see the value of what you are offering. When attempting to influence someone's perception, keep in mind that humans are naturally loss-adverse. This means they are more likely to take a less risky option, even if it promises them less gain. The best way to minimize the aversion to risk is to convince the people you are negotiating with that they have something concrete to lose if they don't make a deal with you. Below is a list of steps to follow to make a loss seem concrete and assist in closing a deal. 1. Start with empathizing with your opponent. 2. Let them go first. 3. Establish a range of prices you're willing to accept. 4. Don't just focus on money. Bring non-monetary benefits into the negotiation. 5. Always use odd numbers. This will make your price seem more reasonable. 6. Offer your opponents a gift to get them into a generous mood. How to negotiate a better salary. Who doesn't want to get paid more for the work they do? If you're looking to receive a raise in the workplace, first collect all the knowledge you may think you need such as what people are making in comparable jobs, and put those numbers in a range of possible salaries. Then, when you approach your manager, be ready to sell yourself as you present the numbers you found through research. Be persistent with your delivery, and be willing to accept non-monetary items, such as more vacation time and better benefits. You will be surprised how much you can gain by just asking. Create the Illusion of Control in 2001, Voss was called to the Philippines to deal with the same hostage-taking militant group he had dealt with a year earlier. This time, he did not experience the same success as during his previous visit. 
This hostage negotiation ended in a shootout, and the hostages did not survive. But the situation taught him a lot about control and the illusions of it. Don't try to negotiate in a firefight. Just as two people in a relationship say things they regret during a dispute, it is impossible to negotiate when bullets are flying. Before entering a negotiation, make sure there are no proverbial bullets. If you are in a position that requires exposure to actual bullets, such as during a hostage crisis, make sure you are a safe distance away from the action and wait for emotions to die down before attempting to speak to your perpetrator. There is always a team on the other side. When negotiating a deal, it is rarely a one-on-one -on -one debate. Usually, there is a team on each side. This is important to note, because often, each side will only send one or two people to negotiate. When this happens, it is important to make sure the information traded between the negotiators is passed back to the team. If the proper communication is not passed on, it can lead to a non-committal yes, or a deal that is doomed from the start. Avoid a showdown. You've probably heard the saying, don't fight fire with fire. This is 100% true. Once a negotiation begins to become negative, emotions flare and you will never be able to come to an agreement. To avoid this, try not to use words that may trigger the other side to become aggressive towards you in the first place. Suspend unbelief. In a negotiation, there is often a form of unbelief present on both sides. It is your responsibility to overcome it. To suspend unbelief, begin by asking open-ended questions that require more than a simple yes or no. These questions usually begin with how, which leaves room for your opponents to come up with a solution. The best part is that when they do come up with a solution, they will see it as their idea. Meanwhile, you've been in control the entire time. Additionally, this will avoid any feelings of malice and help avoid a showdown, which, as mentioned before, needs to be avoided at all costs. There is a common misconception that, as a negotiator, you need to get others to believe in everything you say. This is not true. As a negotiator, your job is to remove unbelief from your opponents and then slowly begin to coax them to seeing things from your point of view, all while giving them the illusion that they are in control. Calibrate your questions. The secret to leading someone to your point of view is to carefully calibrate your questions. Use words such as how and it seems, but be careful of your tone as well. Using words such as perhaps and maybe to soften the message you have to deliver. Make sure you ask open-ended questions to avoid feelings of anger and aggression. It isn't enough to just ask calibrated questions. You must also ensure that you are using them to lead your opponent to the topic you want to discuss or the viewpoint you want them to see. This can take a lot of practice, and Voss recommends rehearsing the lines you may possibly use prior to entering a negotiation. When you're practicing your statements, make sure you avoid words such as why, which often seem accusatory. Use your calibrated questions often, especially early on in a negotiation. How not to get paid Simply avoiding a showdown and calibrating your questions is not enough to become a master negotiator. In order to fully take control of the room and arrive at the solution you desire, you must possess self-control and emotional regulation. Remember, you must become a master of your own emotions before you can begin to influence or change the emotions of others. The number one way to keep your cool is to bite your tongue. No matter what is asked, take a moment, bite your tongue, and give yourself a moment to think rationally before you answer. Beyond that, if you are ever verbally assaulted during a negotiation, resolve to never launch a counterattack. This is counterproductive and will only lead to the dreaded showdown. Always remain positive, even when the other side makes a negative comment, and you'll be surprised by how far it gets you. Guarantee execution. During a prison siege in Louisiana, Multiple prisoners holed up inside the prison, keeping some of the guards hostage. Many of them wanted to surrender, but were afraid of the repercussions if they did. The crisis negotiators on scene minimized this by asking the prisoners to send out one man as an example. When he was returned safely, the remaining prisoners would be notified via walkie-talkie. The prisoners agreed to the plan, and when their friend was indeed returned to his cell unharmed, 
they quickly backed down and the guards were released. Yes is nothing without how. There is a common misconception that, as a negotiator, your only job is to come to an agreement, no matter what you have to promise in order to do so. This will get you nowhere. Not only do you need to promise a solution, you must also be able to deliver it. Sometimes your opponent will ask for something you can't deliver immediately. Instead of promising something you aren't sure you can deliver, buy time. As it turns out, one of the best ways of buying time is to ask calibrated questions. When your opponent answers your questions and you still aren't ready to execute, ask even more questions. Voss was called to Ecuador in 2003 when a man was kidnapped while leading a tour. Voss's team coached the man's wife to continually ask calibrated questions. The results were astounding. The wife asked so many questions and delayed the process so much that many of the kidnappers began to leave. A few days later, they had all left, and the man was able to walk his way to safety. Although delay tactics worked in this specific situation, there are times when it won't work. There are many signs to watch out for to know when to pull back. The number one sign that your delay tactics aren't working is hearing the words, you're right. Remember, these words are only said to brush you off. The second warning sign that you need to change plans is hearing the words, I'll try, because this is just a fancy way of saying, I plan to fail. Influencing those behind the table When you begin a negotiation, remember to always consider those who aren't physically at the table. Once you get to know the people behind those sitting across the table from you, you can truly begin to influence them to achieve your desired result. The key to a successful negotiation is to have everyone involved on board. Spotting liars, dealing with jerks, and charming everyone else. Just as in everyday life, in the business world, you will come across people who are unpleasant and lie. In order to sort the liars from the honest ones, you need to keep a close eye on body language. Usually, body language reveals clues to a person's true emotions, even though they may not vocally express them. Also, pay attention to the way things are said and the speaker's tone. All of these can be clues to an individual's true emotions. The 738-55% rule. When you speak to someone, you may think they are getting all their information from what you say. In reality, only 7% of the message you are delivering comes from the words that are spoken. Your tone accounts for 38% and your body language for 55%. Therefore, it's always best to negotiate business face-to-face. -face. That way, all the information is available for you to evaluate. If for some reason you cannot physically be in a negotiation, it's best to use FaceTime or Skype to assist in reading body language. When reading body language, tone, and voice, there are many cues to look for to establish the honesty of the speaker. Liars use far more words than truth-tellers and will often use third-person pronouns such as he, her, and it. In addition, a liar will often use more complex words to try to confuse the listener. Also, the more important someone is, the fewer first-person pronouns he or she will use. This can be a good indicator to know if the person you are speaking with is actually in charge of the negotiation or simply a pawn for a larger player. Bargain hard. One of Voss's proudest moments during his years in negotiation is a personal win. Voss really wanted a red Toyota 4Runner, but the price tag was just a bit too high. Using many of the tactics discussed in this book, and lots of calibrated questions, he was able to talk the price down from the $36,000 price tag to his $30,000 budget. What type are you? Now, you might think that there is no way you will ever be able to bargain like Voss, but it is possible. You just need to work at it. Each person has a unique negotiation style influenced by his or her parents, upbringing, and lifetime experiences. It is important to be familiar with all your strengths and weaknesses. When you self-evaluate your negotiation skills, first find out what type of negotiator you are. Keep in mind that it is possible to be a mix of two styles, and even be a little bit of all three. 1. Analysts Analysts are thoughtful and methodical. They often like to work on their own. Analysts have a tight rein on their emotions and are detail-oriented. They can excel at the late-night DJ voice, 
but also struggle with tone in a way that makes their opponent think they are detached from the conversation at hand. Analysts will spend time researching before negotiation, as they hate to be surprised. For this reason, analysts are quick to lose trust if they feel their efforts are not reciprocated. It isn't a good idea to ask an analyst too many questions, as this will make them wary when they aren't sure what answers you are looking for. When asked a question, analysts require time to think. This silence can often be misinterpreted by other people as anger, but this is most certainly not the case. When dealing with this type of person, it is important to present the facts in a clear and logical manner. If everything you're reading here sounds like you, then you're probably an analyst. The best advice Voss has for you is to remember to smile when you talk. This will help you connect more closely with your counterparts. 2. Accommodator Negotiators who are accommodators want to focus on building a relationship with their opponents. Accommodators love communicating and prefer a free-flowing conversation. They are the most likely to build a great relationship with their opponents, even if they never actually see the deal. Accommodators tend to be very easy to approach, to talk to, and to seek to maintain the peace. When dealing with accommodators, make sure you approach them with a friendly demeanor. Actively listen to their ideas and answer with calibrated questions. Because of their giving and friendly nature, Accommodators often approach a negotiation less prepared and are quick to promise things they may or may not deliver. If you find yourself more passionate about the person behind the table than the negotiation itself, then you are probably an accommodator. It is important to stick to what you excel at, but make sure not to let the conversation drift to idle chit-chat. While your friendly demeanor will go over well with another accommodator, Beware of dealing with analysts or assertive types, as they will want to get straight to the point. 3. Assertive Assertive negotiators consider time to be money. They will not want to delay with idle chatter or silences. These negotiators often have large personalities. They are direct and to the point, basing all their business relationships on mutual respect. Assertive types need to be heard, and they will struggle to listen if they feel their opinion has not been recognized. If you find yourself across the table from an assertive type, make sure you listen to what he or she has to say and minimize silences. Assertive negotiators will see every silence as an opportunity to speak. It is best to use the mirror technique with them. But you can also use labels and summaries to help build the trust bond. Does this sound like you? If so, Make sure you watch your tone when you engage in business dealings. Often, the assertive tone can be mistaken for harshness. Use calibrated questions and labels to help build a bond with your counterparts. When you enter a business deal, it is extremely important to identify what type of negotiators your counterparts are. This will help you to better understand both what they say and what is left unsaid. Then you can react appropriately. Taking a punch Whenever you enter a situation in which you need to bargain, you most likely have a number in mind right from the start. You don't want to reveal this number right away. Instead, wait for your opponent to open the price dialogue, and then begin to name your price range. If you believe you are being led into a trap that is forcing you to speak first, name a high but believable price for the market. This will keep you from having to reveal your price too soon. It will also show your counterpart that you mean business. Punching back, using assertion without getting used by it. If you find a negotiation coming to a stalemate, it is important you shake things up to force the negotiations back on track. This is the time when a why question may be appropriate. As mentioned previously, why questions should generally be avoided as they can seem like attacks, but desperate times, like an almost stalemate, call for desperate measures. Just make sure that your why question deflects back on you and doesn't come across as an attack on your opponent. When you enter a negotiation with an end game in mind, you must also enter ready to walk away from that end plan if needed. Desperation is not the correct way to close any deal, and chances are you won't get what you came to the table for. Ackerman Bargaining The Ackerman Bargaining Model is an outline of how to decide what price to start with based on the final price you would like to receive. First, set your goal. Then set your first offer at 65% of your final desired price. 
Next, you're going to calculate three different increments, 85% of your final price, followed by 95, and then 100%. When calculating your final amount, use exact numbers, including the decimal if applicable. Besides these numbers, make sure you are also armed with a non-monetary item to toss into the deal if needed. When starting the negotiation, present your 65% calculation and then slowly increase as the negotiation progresses until you are at your 100% price. Then, if a deal still hasn't been reached, toss in your non-monetary item. This method of bargaining uses all the tactics we've discussed, and you may be surprised at how well it works. Find the black swan. No matter how prepared you are for a negotiation, you must always be ready to discover the one thing you are not prepared for. This unknown unknown is called the black swan. Uncovering unknown unknowns. In order to prepare for something that is pretty much impossible to prepare for, you must constantly evaluate the world around you and listen carefully to what it is telling you. Always ask questions. Watch for nonverbal cues and run everything you're thinking by someone else on your side. Ensure you don't just focus on the end goal, but on each step along the way. This will keep you from being distracted and give you the leverage you need to discover black swans. Leverage has many aspects. It can be something like time or even something as basic as necessity. Positive leverage is when you have control over the way negotiations are going to go because you control both sides of the bargain. One of the most common examples of positive leverage is when you seek to purchase a car. Both parties involved stand to gain from the sale. Negative leverage is the type of leverage present in a kidnapping. This is where one side has something the other side needs or wants, and this leverage only works because of the human desire to avoid loss. It is never suggested to use negative leverage in a negotiation, and usually it can make your opponent openly hostile. But if you find yourself on the receiving end of negative leverage, evaluate your situation and your opponents. Ask yourself what their motives are. Analyze them and use calibrated questions to disarm them. Know their religion. A common black swan presents itself when you don't know your opponent's religion. Religion is a strong deciding factor for many emotional decisions. Although religion can often have negative impacts on rational thinking, it can also be used as a tool to draw your opponent's attention and create a connection. When attempting to discover or relate to someone's religion, make sure you listen, review, and then listen again. When you do speak, tread carefully, as religion used in the wrong context can set off an individual. The Similarity Principle Your best defense against a black swan, especially one involving religion, is to make yourself similar to your opponent. As humans, we are naturally drawn to what is similar or familiar, and this unconsciously breeds trust. Don't assume that the other side is incorrect or has bad information. Instead, Empathize with your opponents and evaluate the information they have. If you only have their scope of information, how would you feel? Overcoming fear and learning to get what you want out of life. As you head into negotiations on your own, armed with your newfound knowledge, make sure you watch for unguarded moments. These are often the moments that hint at or even reveal black swans. If you find yourself in the middle of a negotiation and something seems off or doesn't make sense, then you are most definitely dealing with a black swan. It is time to find it before it can catch you off guard. Remember, make your interests known, face your fears, and don't avoid conflict. These things will damage a negotiation before it even begins. Even if you never end up negotiating for anything more than a car, Voss wants his readers to use the knowledge in this book to overcome their fear of the negotiation itself. When conflicts present themselves, embrace them and face them head-on. You might be pleasantly surprised by the outcomes you experience.